Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If we can move towards our seats, please. We're going to start in just a moment. If we can move towards our seats, please. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for the people who have dedicated their lives to the helping professions. We give you thanks for the insights of mental health that give us the opportunity to process what it is that we're experiencing in the world around us. Thank you for coming to be present to us in special ways through these people who've come to be with us today. Give us joy in our hearts, peace in our souls, and the opportunity to be light in a, work, in a world that seems entirely too dark. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So four and a half years ago, I got an email from Earl Donaldson saying, so Samaritan Counseling used to have a partnership with Holy Communion, and we'd like to get it going again. And it took us about two years, I think, to work that through, um, but we did, and it has been a wonderful and life-giving partnership both for Holy Communion and for Samaritan Counseling. For those of you who don't know Samaritan, it's a nonprofit organization in town that's committed to bringing high-quality mental health care to everybody, the insured, the uninsured, those with resources, those without resources. And they base in churches, so we actually have one of their offices here at Holy Communion upstairs. Uh, Dr. Lindsay Pate is in residence here several days, um, doing some work uh, on, on behalf of the community. Uh, as part of our sharing with uh, Samaritan, they offer us some time in Christian education uh, to bring their skills and gifts to bear. Uh, and as we were looking at this semester's offerings, what we started to realize was we are, um, at the time we were planning this semester, under just this barrage of uh, sad things coming to us uh, in the world and in the news. Uh, and that has not let up in the last several months since we made these plans. So I'm just so grateful to have with us uh, Dr. Earl Donaldson and Mr. Rod Spencer from Samaritan Counseling to give us reflections from their mental health and faith-based perspective on how we deal with a world that might just be too much to bear. Earl, Rod, welcome to Holy Communion. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Rod and I are going to be tag teaming, and we've got these things and all that, so if, they're, if we juggle back and forth, please forgive us. And I'm also at the, the tail end of a, a, a crud, and the only time I experience it is in the morning, so I'm a little froggy this morning. But we're here today to just kind of talk about and go through just a lot of the stuff that's going on. And we titled it basically when it's just too much to bear because it seems like we get overwhelmed with what's going on in the world today, whether it's um, racial, whether it's violence, whether it's hate, whether it's this or that. It just seems like there's so much being fed to us that it's just overwhelming. So what Rod and I would like to do is spend this week talking about what were the issues and what, how it's affecting us. And then next week we're going to break it into what can we do about it. So we also want this to be interactive. So when you have thoughts, when you have input, when you have questions, we want you to be able to speak up and join into the, the conversation and the dialogue. Would you like to add anything? So we basically titled this when it's too much to bear. I'm technologically illiterate, so bear with me. So managing your distress in troubling times. Here's our information. Um, yes? Get closer to the mic. Okay. Maybe it would help if I turned, turned it, it on. on. That would be helpful, and I'm going <laughs> to adjust that back. I come as advertised, right? And now we're going to have to switch back and forth, and he'll have to turn his mic on, and I'll have to turn mine off, so bear with us. Um, here's our basic information. We actually have five locations across Memphis, um, Collierville, Germantown, 
Holy Communion, and two sites in Midtown. Um, if you're interested in our website or who's working there or whatever, you can reach us through there. That's the end of our advertisement. So, basically, I think everyone in here knows that these are difficult times. Now, we've always had difficult times. I think that's just the history of the earth. It depends on everything's relative. But I think we all recognize these are difficult times in what's going on, not only in our country, but also across the world. Um, it seems like you can't do anything without experiencing something somewhere that hits us right here, that really hits. And so what we want to do today is just kind of talk about what's going on. And when we think about some of these things, we're just going to kind of walk through some of the things that are impacting us, and we're going to also get your input about what impacts you on a regular basis. And some days, of course, are better than others. But some days are obviously worse than others. There's things that happen, things that go on, that really hit us a lot. Um, I'm Rod Spencer. I have several hats that I wear. And one of the hats I wear is very related to this topic. I am the lead crisis counselor for youth villages. I go out in the community to schools, hospitals, homes, anywhere basically and see children up to the age of 18 who are in some kind of crisis. One thing we've noticed in the last couple of weeks is that the number of calls we get from schools has gone up about 10 times what it was a month ago. After the Parkland incident, we got bombarded with schools calling us because some child said, um, you know, I just like to kill so and so or I'm so mad I could shoot up this class. And in the past, teachers may have sort of passed that off, like, yeah, they're just being a kid and saying stuff. That kind of stuff is taken very, very seriously now. And we go out to schools and assess kids to make sure that they're not one of those kids who would bring a gun to school and shoot up the place. So uh, everybody's on red alert now, especially schools, uh, because of these recent incidents. Um, one thing that's interesting, though, is that we have, after this, this uh, recent Parkland thing, we have schools that are calling us because more children are saying they're going to shoot up the school than there are kids who are afraid to go to school. That's interesting that teenagers sort of have taken this on as a new way to express themselves. Empower. Yes, empower and get attention and all that. And Generally, they don't realize how serious what they're saying is. But in our culture and in this time, in this context, just saying, I want to shoot somebody at school is going to get the police and the sheriff and all kinds of people involved with you. Um, so we live on this really tense edge right now of we're hypervigilant about anything that could possibly lead to one of these disasters. So um, the, the climate has changed tremendously in the last month about crisis. The other thing is that when we talk about kids like that and what Rod is experiencing, we're talking about um, when we look at those of us in this room, we experience things at a different level, of course, than a teenager. And while teenagers may be the smartest that they're ever going to be in their life when they're 15 or 16 years old, the reality is those of us in this room, we hear things every single day or we might say something every single day that causes great distress in ourselves or in others. I know I, I can make a comment here and there that I am simply making as offhand comment but I don't know how anybody in this room might hear it, take it, twist it, understand it. They may have a personal experience, a personal tie-in. And so even if I made a, a joke, you know, about the sandwich that walks into the bar and the bartender says, I'm sorry, but we don't serve food here, I don't know if that's going to really impact somebody. And so we live in this time now where it's almost like Unless you really know the people you're with, what you say or what you do may 
be one of those things that triggers a distress in other people. And it may not be that what I say really triggers you, but you've just had a bad day, you've just had a loss, you've just had something happen in your life, and it's just that final thing for the day for you or the week, and it creates that kind of arousal, anxiety, anger, etc. But we're living in this everyday kind of thing where we're bombarded with all these different messages, anger, hatred, division, and tragedy. And so how do we react to it? Let's see where we are. Also, we deal a lot with this group's okay, that group isn't. This person's okay, that person isn't. And each one of us in here has probably experienced this kind of thing where we're not in the in group in some setting where we go or we are treated differently because of something. And so as we go along, that kind of begins to accumulate and stack up as well. And then, of course, we're hearing about all these things as well. And so we get this inundation going on where all these things begin to just add up and accumulate. And then there are these things like Parkland, Las Vegas, you name it. Things that you just can't really comprehend. How does someone think that this is the thing to do? You know, a lot of people say, I just can't understand that. We don't think that way, of course. I hope we don't. But that person is thinking that this is a viable option, that this is what's going to take care of whatever anger or resentment or frustration they have. And it's, it's so alien to how we think, it's really hard to wrap our heads around it. And just when we think it's the worst thing we've ever heard, you know something else is coming. Or you know someone else is going to try and outdo it. You know, since Parkland, there's been at least 35 documented cases where there was actually a plan, weapons, ammunition, messages saying I'm going to outdo this, outdo that, and it's just sort of overwhelming. And so that's what we kind of want to talk about today. Let me give you this, okay. well, and you can take over. What I would like to know from you all is when you hear the news about the next horrific thing that happens, what goes on inside of you? What do you feel? What clicks inside of you? This is participation. So just say what word happens inside of you when you hear about the next horrific event in our culture. Grief. Grief. Sadness. 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 Turn off the TV. Take an axe to it. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry, somebody said something up here. Unbelief. Uh, disbelief. Yeah. It used to be shock, but now it's not Yeah, and I, th I think we become numb, in a sense, to this onslaught of traumatic information that we get. I had a, a client this week in my private practice. Now, she doesn't have anything to do with any of this stuff, but she came in and said, you know, I watched a, a videotape that some kid made on their phone during the Parkland event, and she said, I cannot get those images out of my head. She is experiencing like secondary trauma from having been exposed to that. And my belief is that our whole culture is experiencing some level of trauma because of what we get exposed to over and over. And like you said, one of the effects it has on us is we just get numb and it doesn't really shock us that much anymore. Or it does for a short while and, and then we sort of, it becomes normal again. Um, you know, I think about how after 9-11, everybody is very hyper about safety and airports and airplanes and not wanting to ride airplanes and things like that. That's what we call avoidance. And, but after a couple years, what happens? We sort of get used to it, right? And, and that's a strange thing about human beings is we can get used to horrible things. 
and it doesn't bother us that much anymore. We become desensitized. But it's kind of like TV and movies, you know, from the 60s, what were rated R movies in the 60s are now PG movies these days. And so when we talk about violence or sexuality or whatever in the movies, think about what that's changed just in our lifetime. You remember when we were growing up, the bad guy, when they got shot, they just went, ugh, you know, and they had the famous dying scene. But now when someone dies, it blows their arm off or it blows their head off. And it's the same kind of thing. People have sort of gotten used to it. Remember in the 80s, the horrific horror movies? Now kids laugh about that and how cheesy that is. But it's the same thing in our lives that these things hit us and then we slowly figure, our body figures out a way to adapt to it. <coughs> because we can't stay in this heightened sense of horror forever. However, we don't adapt to it without changes in our body. Trauma actually changes the structure of our brains. Literally changes the structure of our brains. We become different human beings when we have experienced trauma. Our memory doesn't work as well. We are hypervigilant. We're constantly looking around for the next thing that's going to happen. Um, these are changes in our brain that happen when we're exposed to trauma. So very subtly, all this stuff is changing us as human beings, I think. Biologically changing us to where we become numb and desensitized or overly anxious and hypervigilant. If you've had a car accident, someone's broken into your house, whatever, something's stolen, that's what's going on in you physically and cognitively. Because as you drive in Memphis, <laughs> as you drive in Memphis, if you've had a car accident, you know what that feels like for you. It's bad enough, but if you've had a car accident, you become this heightened arousal when you go out driving around in Memphis. If you've had somebody broken in, break into your house, every creak or, or little unusual sound and you are right back there in that moment. And so keep in mind what all this that we hear about today does to us physically and cognitively. It's changing us, as Rod said. When 9-11 happened, think, think back, this is 17 years ago. It's really amazing it's been 17 years. But they showed it over and over and over and over and over. And it's like each time we were traumatized again and again and again. And everybody in this room, you don't have to see it on TV to envision it in your mind. And when you think about that, at least when I think about that, it's still just the most overwhelming thing that somebody thought that that's the thing to do. How many of you remember where you were when you heard about 9-11? Absolutely. I mean, you remember where you were when John F. Kennedy was shot. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And, and, and that is because trauma stores in our brain in a different way and in a different place from our regular memories. It stores in a place where we can actually re-experience that trauma again. And, and I'm sure you all know about people who've been abused, physically or sexually abused. They're very easily triggered by anything that reminds them of that trauma. And, and so all of us at some lower level, get triggered all the time by this stuff to where we become more hypervigilant, uh, I think even depressed in some ways, too. Um, we talk, Earl and I were talking about how anxiety and depression, Earl said, yeah, depression used to be the main um, mental health diagnosis, and now it's anxiety. Yeah. The it's anxiety. we live in. Yeah, we, we live in an anxious world. I looked up, I, I've been involved in thinking about um, something called cultural trauma because I believe there is cultural trauma. The definition of cultural trauma is 
Cultural trauma occurs when members of a collectivity feel they have been subjected to a horrendous event that leaves indelible marks upon their group consciousness, marking their memories forever and changing their future identity in fundamental and irrevocable ways. I, I think we have cultural trauma by that definition. Yes, and, and that's what these teenagers are doing. They're not saying I'm scared to go to school. They're saying I'm going to go to school and shoot it up. Or I'm going to school and dying. I have a chance of dying at school. Instead of I'm going to get bullied at school. <laughs> yeah, which I'm going to I die at school. Um, they are worrying about is this the day when some kid's going to get me. And so if you remember the stress is just to be a teenager, think of adding the fact that you feel like you could die any day if you go to school. Add that to normal teenage angst and think what it does. Right, Be because human beings have this unique ability to think what if. As far as, there, as, as I know, there are no other animals on this planet that can think what if, which is we project possibilities into the future. And so, in another way, we traumatize ourselves by projecting what the possibilities are in the future, which is another reason I think we have so much anxiety rampant these days. Um, and I'm talking about kids who live in, in neighborhoods where people get shot every day. They're even being traumatized by this. So can you imagine? It's got to be a much greater trauma if they live with gunshots and people being killed every day, but now they're afraid to go to school. What does that say about our culture? So, one of the things that I also wanted to do was when we, when we talked about everything that we get bombarded with, there's that initial, ah, ah, and then you want to say, please make it stop, please, and then it's just, sometimes it's just too much to bear. Sometimes you just intentionally avoid the TV and the internet, social media, etc., and think about all of the ways and the things that distress you. What are some of the things that seem to impact you more than other things? One of the things I have to fight is uh, despair. Because there are so many things happening that are wrong. And there is such ineffectual notions about how to come. There's some consensus that make any difference in doing something. People are on extremes about what to call, how to call it, how not to call it. It's very difficult. I feel despairing sometimes. It feels real hopeless. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's depression. It's a form of depression yes. when you think things are hopeless, the future is hopeless. And you feel powerless to do anything about it. And so then you will we'll be... Sorry. We will begin to talk about what to do about it next week. But I also want to bring up, I want you to think for a moment of all the ways that this kind of information enters into your universe, your stream of consciousness. Originally, when we go back to, let's say, World War I, People got their information from the newspaper, and that was pretty much it. By the 20s, newspapers and radio. By World War II, TV, or rather newspapers, radio, and some people had TV. By the time we were in the 50s, you had TV, radio, newspapers. By the time we got into the 60s and 70s, if you were lucky, you got four channels on your TV. But TV was taking a bigger part in providing information along with news and radio. And then, in the 80s, cable. And you thought you were really great if you had 70 channels, right? And so now we have newspaper, radio, TV, cable. And in the 90s, here comes the internet and email. And of course, we progress now in Think about the ways that everything comes into your knowledge or your awareness. 
the sources, the, just the sheer number of ways you can find out about what's going on in the world. Um, you know, it, emails kind of seem quaint compared to everything else that's going on. When Facebook, when we hear everything about Facebook, whether it's just the content of Facebook and the stories they tell, etc., or the anger, or the division, or the prejudices that get expressed on it, but we also have these faster things streaming services, Instagram, Snapchat, that are even faster. And of course now we know that all of these things sometimes put out things that are patently false for a reason. To influence us. To create anger, sadness, outrage. And so think about how inundated and saturated we are with this nowadays. Now personally I don't have Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, or Facebook, but everybody around me does, and they're always going, look at this, look at this, and it's like, stop it. I don't want to look at it because if I did, I'd have it, right? But we also have to begin to think of, if you go to a buffet and it's all you can eat, at least for me, when I leave there, I don't feel good. <laughs> I'm lucky if I can lay down to sleep. I may have to sleep in a chair sitting up. But this is what's going on. We are getting oversated with this information. We are getting full of everything. And think about just the collective impact of all of this. As Rod was talking about how this happens to us, it begins to change how we think. And of course, our thinking is where all of our emotion comes from. It's not like my gallbladder has any emotions, right? And really, my heart doesn't have any emotions. All my emotion starts here. Whether that's happy, positive emotion, or whether that's anxiety, fear, anger, resentment, disgust, whatever. And so if we're talking about everything being here, when you get that wham in your face from any of these sources, think about what that does. If I'm sleeping tonight and I hear this at my window, and I, what do I think? Okay, what else? Someone's there. What else? The squirrels are scratching at the window, right? But depending upon what I think and how I interpret that, it creates an emotion. If it's rain, that's great. We could use the rain. I'm tired of the rain or whatever. If it's someone's at the door, at the window, trying to get in, fear, anxiety, panic. If it's the squirrels tearing up my window again and I'm going to have to sand it and paint it, I'm not quite afraid. I'm angry at the squirrels and I'm going to go take care of it. So you see how that's the same, but what each one of us hears and thinks creates that emotions and a behavior that follows. You know, if it's rain, you roll over and go back to sleep. If someone's at the window that you think, you hide in the closet, you call 911, you get a baseball bat, the gun, the butcher knife, whatever. If it's the squirrels, I may get that baseball bat and go out there and get them anyway. So the thing is, when our brains get exposed to so much trauma, how more likely are we to think it's somebody outside the window rather than the wind or the rain or the squirrels, right? That That's going to happen more quickly, more easily, because we're tuned to horrible things. And if you hear nine bad things in a row, you're just assuming the tenth thing is going to be bad too. Well, and this is another thing about human beings. We are hardwired to find the negative. We are hardwired to see the dangerous. It's a survival mechanism. I mean, if we, if we only looked at positive things, none of us would be here. 
We're here because we survived because we paid attention to negative things. But think how that impacts us when these negative things become trauma, not just, oh, I left my keys in the car, but, oh my gosh, they're going to launch a nuclear bomb today if you lived in Hawaii. Or the odds, <laughs> or the odds are greater that something's going to happen. And, and, and the problem is human beings, along with some other animals, are hardwired to what we call fight, flight, or freeze. You've heard of that, fight, flight, or freeze before? That is our reaction to a perception of danger. So let's say you're driving down the street and all of a sudden out of your peripheral vision you see this car running through a stop sign. Your fight, flight, or freeze response snaps in just like that. And you don't even take time to think about it. You can't take time to think about it because if you've thought about it, you might be dead. You have to have this automatic response. And the problem is, we get attuned to having that automatic response. I tell people it's like driving your car in first gear at 60 miles an hour. Our bodies are not meant to be in that red alert hyper mode so much of the time. And it has physiological effects on us as human beings when we focus and are in that hyper vigilant aware state so much of the time. Well, and research shows the average 17-year-old, no offense. I'm 14. Okay, <laughs> that's good. Still no offense. The average 17-year-old checks their phone 95 times a day. Now, the average adult, if you have a smartphone, I'm not gonna say, but think about how many times you check your phone in a day. Or every time that ping makes you do that. Or what you realize when you don't have your phone. What is that like? There's panic, right? Or, I'm, I'm out of touch with the world now. Or when you're sitting with a group of people trying to interact and someone's doing this. That's an interesting point. Well, or if we're working with one of you as an adult, we can't treat your home system. We can only work with you. Which is why I'm embarrassed to say, because I want a home system in my office. <laughs> but we can spend an hour with you and work with whatever the issue is, but then you get six days and 23 hours back out in your world, <coughs> which we can't, we can't influence the people you interact with the same way we can't really influence that and what comes in. The other thing I want to also bring up is that think about, we, we think get on inundated with this, but this is where we also get stuck. Everyone is telling us what we're supposed to think, what we're supposed to believe, what's happening, etc. But then there's much more personal ways that we get in this information. Our friends, our family members, neighbors, bosses, our children's friends, parents, teachers, people at, out in the community, etc. We're getting that information from people there as well. It's not just Facebook or TV or newspapers. It's everybody. It's church. It's clergy, it's church members. What does the denomination believe? What does our priest, our, our priest or pastor believe? What do the members of our church believe? And then of course, our local news. I'm not even gonna get into that, turn it off. Just stop, stop, because they, they are like the leading negative source, anyway. Off the soapbox with that. So, too much information, too much division, too much intolerance, too much hate, too much shouting. I'm exhausted <laughs> just talking about all this. But this all needs to stop. And to bring it sort of theological level, one of my beliefs as a Christian is that good overcomes evil, that light overcomes dark. 
that life overcomes death. And we cannot let these things change that belief, which if we become cynical and hopeless, that can change. So I think that's what we have to hold on to, that belief, regardless of what it looks like around us, there is that belief that life and light overcome the things that we're dealing with now. How many of you believe that? I think that's a basic Christian tenet we have, that life overcomes death. Um, we have another song and dance next week, but I would like to hear from y'all what would be most helpful for you when we come back and talk about, now what can we do about this? And I think we've made a few little hints today. Yes. Yeah, sure, I wasn't aware of that. That's, that's great to hear that. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, we'll, we'll we, we can talk about, about that. that. Yeah, that's a really good point because it seems sometimes like you just can't get it out of your head. Any other thoughts you'd like us to sort of address next week? Absolutely. Well, people have come to uh, equate respect and agreement because if you don't agree, then you don't get respect. If you do agree, then you get respect. Respect and agreement are completely independent of each other. You can respect people that you vehemently disagree with. So we might talk about respect, too, next week, because there's a lot of disrespect going on. It is very hard to overcome a home environment. You, you can be at school eight hours a day, but when you go back to a certain environment, everything you learned goes out the window. Because the people... No, no, it's not wrong. I'm simply saying... I don't believe that would change the whole problem. I, mean, I think it might address some of it and help it, but until you change the, the roots of where this problem is, which is in the family and in the culture. No, I, I agree. I agree. Well, uh, Sandy said we have to quit at 10 after on that clock, so it's 10 after on that clock. So thank you all for being here today. Enjoyed the discussion, the dialogue, and we'll continue it next week.